Well, thank you very much for joining us tonight on Autograph. My name is Nathaniel Atto, and I always bring you the show from here, uh, the Table Bay Bar in Alisa Hotel. Okay, so tonight we're talking about a young man who's 29 years of age, yet has done so much in a career that started from the year 2009. And if I say when it started, I'm talking about when it got on its feet, from 2009 till now. He's won several awards, countless ones and has been nominated probably close to 100 times in the award schemes here in Ghana and across the globe as well. For a young man who's been able to, you know, perform on the same stage as the likes of Jay-Z, Buster Rhymes, Memphis Bleak, and others, he surely has a big story to tell. But he's not only a rapper, he's also a movie producer and also functions very effectively within the advertising and marketing communications industry. He has a story of rough, rough patches and uh, rough terrains and running, you know, up and down the place just to make sure that he was able to achieve his dream. Very, very interesting story to tell. But of course, many of you always refer to him for what he does as a hip-hop rapper. It's very, very interesting that you have people who do the hip-hop genre in this time and are able to make it. Well... That's the very interesting story of my guest who has many other things that apply to his life. It is a story of versatility and is a story of survival and strong will. It will be right here on Autograph over the next one hour. Stay right there. My guest will be with me very shortly. <laughs> Thank you very much for staying with us. And I was talking earlier about someone who may not necessarily have had that struggle, struggle life uh, starting off, but surely has made a very good mark for himself uh, internationally and uh, has been flying Ghana's flag internationally a great deal. I mean, for somebody who at his age has been able to share stages with the likes of Rick Ross, Jay-Z, Memphis Bleak, Buster Rhymes, then we know that we surely have a big story to tell. And of course, I'm talking about the one and only D Black. D Black, how you doing? I'm good, boss. Hi. Mm. Great to see you, huh? Thank you, man. But I struggled. <laughs> yeah. Okay, let's put it in, in context. I mean, a lot of people who you know, are successful and are icons for uh, the other generations are you know, mostly you know, people who have seen a certain struggle in life. And I'm talking about the smoothness, you know, mm -hmm. in your upbringing, the kind of home you came from and all of that. So if I say that, then you didn't really struggle. I came from a broken home. <laughs> well, I a broken from, home. Tell me about it. Yeah, um, my parents split up when I was eight years old, mm. just before I turned eight. And um, my dad had ten kids, five different women. Wait, ten kids? Okay, so where do you fall in the uh, pecking order? Number seven. Number seven? Do you know all of them? You are yeah, I know every single one of them. Okay. Did you all live together? No, we never all lived together in the same place. Max was about five of us in the same place at the same time. Okay. But um, uh, I grew up with my mom, eventually. I see. Uh, my dad was somewhere else. I grew up with my mother and my grandmother. I see. Um, I, have a, I have a sister with whom I share the same dad and mom. So it was me, my little sister, grandmother, mother, struggling to make ends meet. My mom's a civil servant. Okay. Uh, she works with the tourist board, and she's worked there her whole life. So imagine raising two kids on your on own. On her salary. Yeah. Mm. Um, so then I moved out to the house when I was about 18. Um, I decided to pursue a career in music. She, didn't, she wasn't hearing it. So I, I moved out to the house. I started doing my own thing. Started when you moved out to the house, where did you live? Different places. I even ended up sleeping in a, in a couch of one of the VVIP members. I see which one. Uh, <laughs> Prodigal. Oh, you slept in Prodigal's couch? Yeah. For, okay, for how long? For quite a while, for about a year. I see. And then uh, I started staying at Reggie Ruxton's place also for a while. Mm. Um, then I started recording music. Um, I started recording. And I saw you, you featured in one of his... Uh, Videos are one of his big, yeah, big hits. Yeah, I was uh, 18, and um, yeah. he's good friends with my older brother. 
Okay. So he was uh, he was shooting a video telling a story about how his ex-wife cheated on him. Yeah. And my brother was a part of that story. So he wanted my brother to play that story, play that part in the music video. My brother wasn't around, so I ended up going to play that part. I and see. then we became friends from there. And that's actually what influenced me to actually start making music because I was hanging around him so much. And then um, from that point, I started making music as a hobby. Um, right after I finished university, and then I released one song with uh, Quick Routine. So how many, okay, so how did you manage to go through, like, from school, from Rich Church School, and then, you know... Okay, so after Rich Church, I went to, I went to Pope John's. Okay. Uh, secondary school and seminary. Yeah. Uh, they wanted me to go to straight line, you know, so... Well, which straight line are you talking about? You know, Pope John's secondary school is not just a secondary school. It's a seminary where they bring well, up so, so, so what, pastors. your mom wanted you to become a, a Catholic priest? My dad was actually the one who pushed my mom to make sure I went there, and and, and I didn't want to go there. What was the reason why? Did you did you have any traits of becoming a? Yeah, you I mean, signs? you know, the stereotypical Ghanaian parent back in the day was thinking if this guy wants to be a rapper, yeah, and I some of a you know, so they wanted to take me away, okay, away from all of that, and then um, they sent me to a seminary. I didn't end up staying in a seminary. I ended up being a, a, a regular student, and then I got suspended, and then I got kicked out. Mm. You got suspended for what? Um, for coming to our crowd to come and chill, and, okay. and then coming to actually try and record music. And then I got See. caught, and then second time again, this time they kicked me out. Okay. And then so you, uh, couldn't, you didn't complete? I didn't finish secondary school in Pujan. Okay, where so did you finish? I came, I came back to Accra. Both parents disappointed, you know. My mom pissed off. And then um, she enrolled me for media classes. There's some school in Adabaka. So I used to, I used to walk there. And then, unfortunately for her, the, stu <laughs> the studio I knew was also in Adabaka. I see. I see. So sometimes. So you never did the remedial classes? You never. No, I did. I did. So okay. I wrote my exams. I passed. Then I wanted to go to the University of Ghana. My mom said, no, you're going to go to the University of Cape Coast. I was like, the University Why? of Cape Coast. Why? 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 Because she thinks that because if you go to Cape Coast, because they'll, she went there. they'll neutralize you? Oh, she was there. And then there. she went there, and it's more strict, you know? Yeah. And, and it's far away. Of course, away. The, the grade points are higher and everything, yeah. so the, no, the but pass there, mark is there's higher. No, there, there, there's no entertainment in University of Cape Coast. Who told you that? I went there. <laughs> <laughs> Zero entertainment. Okay. Everybody's you, studying. Okay, so you think it still holds now? I don't know right now, but... So I went there. I was studying economics as a major. First year... Wow, I went through hell. I only knew like two people from my former school. Wow. And um, after my first year, I was like, nah, I'm not going to study economics. That's not what I want to do. Okay. But luckily for me, when I was applying to universities, I applied to Tech, I applied to Lego, and I applied to UCC Central University. And again, I mentioned in all these four universities. So after my first year in um, Cape Coast, instead of going back to write my exam second year, I didn't write them. And then I reapplied for Lego to study film and music. Mm. And then I got accepted, so I went to Legon. And that's when my mother washed her hands off me. <laughs> she said, do what you want to do. So I, she, she didn't think I'll complete um, I Legon. So I went through and then I finished, but now I'm in a car. And, and, and I'm not living in the house. So I'm either in the hostel, home with my kids, friend's house, because I wanted to pursue music, you know? And, um, okay, so during the time when you were, you know, moving, hopping from place to place, were you keeping contact with your mom? Yeah. Okay. I was. Um, Even though she had washed her hands of you and said, okay, nah, you know she, what? She hadn't, she hadn't said, oh, I've washed my hands of you, you're not my son anymore type. Okay. Like, but she had given up on trying to not Get make you me to do be what in, she wanted you to yeah. do. Yeah. Okay. So now I'm, I'm, I'm moving from studio to studio, trying to record music. And then um, I met this guy called Kwekuti. And then we started. Like of Big Brother Africa. Family. Yeah, and then um, we started. Rec I started recording a mixtape, you know, because at that at, at that time not a lot of people were successful rapping in English in Ghana, so I started doing songs with the people who were rapping in English. So it's like a collective, not just me trying to push something, you know. And I, I ended up doing like four songs with Kweku, and we decided to put all our resources together and, and put out like a like a like a mixtape kind of vibe, you know like four of my own songs, four of his own songs, and four songs we've done together. So we put those 12 tracks together and then released a mixtape called Tiger Practice, and then the first song called Move. And then all of a sudden, 
we got nominated for the Channel O Awards for that video. Yeah, I remember very well. Yeah, and then oh. from that point, they flew us to South Africa. We didn't win, but I, I was I was in a category with the bands, Netasi, Kechuku. And and this was which year? Two thousand and nine. And nine, yeah. 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 So I'm like, oh, it looks like we're doing something right, you know. And there was only two of us from Ghana, and that was me and Kwikuti, and and the current um, artist of the year. That was Ochami Kwame at the time. Mm. So I'm like, if we and the artist of the year are the only people selected from Ghana to represent Ghana as a channel, oh, was we're doing something right. So we didn't. Let, I didn't let it just remain a hobby. We came back and then we released another song called Breathe uh, with Jay So, and then we shot a really, really, really good video for it with uh, Famous Films, Geo. He did the video for free. And he did it for free? Yeah, he did it for free. Big ups, Gio. Thank you so much, man. He did that video for free. And um, the video ended up winning video of the year at the Ghana Music Awards. Yeah. And then the Channel O Awards came again. And this time we didn't get one nomination. We got three. Wow. Overall, Best African Video, mm. Best West African Video, and Best Hip Hop Video. So they flew us again out there. And we didn't win. Nothing. Zero. South Africans and Nigerians won everything, but we were the only Ghanaians. So we came back, and then quickly and I decided to pursue solo careers. And um, I recorded like 30 songs. 30 songs? Yeah, I recorded 30 wow. songs. And I had to pick about 17 to make an album and choose singles. This time I was on my own, you know? It was a hustle, so whatever money, whatever little money I made, I spent on getting to the studio and feeding myself and trying to make this album. And all this while you were you were still staying, hopping around with friends and just, you know, and living in different places. And I was still in school. Okay. So now I'm in my final year. I wrapped up and, and, and now I was pursuing music full time. Then I released a song called Somebody featuring Kwamna Kwamna. Take it easy, son. You were somebody. If they don't talk about you, then you were nobody. Take it easy, son. You were somebody. If they don't talk about you, then you were nobody. Did really, really well. Then I released another song called Get on the Dance Floor. Featuring D crime, and then now I had I had made enough contacts and enough money, I should say, to push my music internationally. So I was focused on doing that because I didn't see Ghana as a as, as a really really big market for the kind of music I was making at the time. I was rapping in only English, you know. So I was looking at going into South Africa and Nigeria. So I was putting my videos on MTV, Channel O, Trace, and all of that stuff, and it was playing on heavy rotation. Then I started getting Channel O Awards as a solo artist as well. Then I got a BET nomination for Best African Act. I was like, wow. Okay, so, so tell me about that BET nomination because that obviously was the height of everything. I mean, all of your struggles and everything finally paying off in that, that, uh, you know, that nomination that came from the BET uh, So Awards. now, I think right, after, right, right before that, my mom had, had come to terms with the fact that I was, um, I was a successful rapper. <laughs> because now people are flying me to South Africa and different parts of Ghana to perform and stuff. I had gone to Nigeria as well and come back. I was yeah. in the newspapers. I was on TV. I would finished school, so she understood, and then she embraced that. So now it's a bit more comfortable, and then, and then I had a daughter. Mm. So now my responsibilities went like this. Okay. You know, so I had to do everything possible to, to take care of my, my kid, and also now... I'm in my twenties, my mom, she's in her fifties. She can't take care of me no more. Now it's vice versa. I have to be paying bills. So it pushed me to to now I had a little sister as well who was still in school. Yeah. You know, so then it pushed me to to do more for myself. Um I went for the BT Awards and I had just one album. I had, I had gone on a nationwide tour with just those two songs and, and we made we brought so many people out. Like every like out of the ten cities we went, like eight of them were sold out, and I had just two songs to my name. You know, I went with other artists as well. Like I had I had Trick opening for me, Sakodia, 
a fear D crime. Yeah, I pronounced it. With only two songs, and you were going all around the place. Yeah, we did wow. a stadium concert at, at the Tamale <laughs> Sports Stadium. There were like 14,000 people there. And you had only two songs? Yeah. <laughs> I had just two songs and one album. Wow. So now, it was off of that tour that I made enough money to be able to go for the BT How much Awards. Money? I can't remember at the time, but that's the money that I used to even buy my plane ticket, pay my hotel bills to go for the BT Awards. And I category with Two Face, who at the time had six albums, Angela Kijo, who had won a Grammy, the Bunch, who had five albums and was like the biggest artist on the continent, who was just signed by Kanye West. All these people were in the same category as me, as best African act. But I knew I wasn't going to win against these people. But the experience and just being nominated for for that off of one album made me know that I could do better and better and better. So I went, I didn't win, came back, did so many shows that I set up a record label, my own studio. Black Avenue Works? Yeah, Black mm -hmm. Avenue Works. Black Avenue Works was actually in existence before before the studio and, and record label and stuff okay. because that's that's what I was doing on the side to to make money for myself. We're doing like advertising and marketing and events. You know, so like club gigs, and you know, helping out like when we did like a Coca Cola launch, like an energy drink called Burn. We did like the activations and stuff that made me buy my first car off of that, off of just that side side deal. And then Black Avenue Music came, like I set up my own studio, started recording my own stuff there. I started working on my second album. Now I had uh, now I had a house in North Kanishi. So we set up the studio there. And then I started working on my second album, which had the old Vera and mm. Bunny Machaka me. And then um, now old Vera went crazy. Then I got more nominations. Every I had like I, I got like 50 nominations and like 14 awards in a space of like four or five years. Mm. You know, and, and and I was traveling everywhere. Wow. That album did really really well. And then um, it's been what it's been three years since I released that album. And then um. In 2014, no, in 2013, we decided to sign on um, Joey B to to my record label. So uh, I took I took like a backseat. We pushed his stuff. Then he came out with a big song, Tonga. And then uh, Black Avenue uh, Music now birthed Black Avenue Films and Black Avenue TV. And we 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 started a TV show with uh, Peace Hyde called the EFG Show. And then we produce a movie. Now, my two managers, uh, Francis and Albert, have um, Francis has a background in film. He's a camera guy, he's an editor. And then I went to I went to secondary school with Albert. Albert is uh, he studied math. He's a sharp guy. And now the in-house producer at Black Avenue, DJ Breezy, was also one of the most sought-after producers at the time. And he can make soundtracks as well as, well as beats. And our video director, Lex, had like a bunch of equipment that we're using to shoot our video. So we decided to put our heads together. And I studied film in, 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 in uni, so we decided to put our heads together and, and make a movie. So whilst um, after Joey's project, we decided to, to invest in a, in a movie. We did a movie called Why Should I Get Married? It had John DeMello, it had Reggie Rockstone, it had um, E.L., Ifia. So you produced that movie? Yeah. Hmm. So we produced them. How movie. well did it do anyway? It did very well. We did like three premieres in Ghana, all sold out. Um, it won an award at the Ghana Movie Awards. Um, it did incredible. It was last last year, November. We did a, we did a big premiere at the Silver Bed Cinemas. And then I decided to focus on working on my third album. Hmm. Uh, so let's, let's hold on with, uh, you know, the third album because I'm... I'm <coughs> There's so much that you're doing at this point, and I'm and I'm wondering how how well you're able to just coordinate all of the efforts, and you know, and uh, how you're able to focus on one thing and drop a few others to the background, and which ones are able to take the background for a longer period for you to focus on others. All right, so if you just join me, um, it's the multiple award-winning rapper uh, D Black. Well, a story of hip hop being told out of Ghana, a story of successful hip hop being told out of Ghana. Very, very rare story indeed, but he's got his hands into different, different things, and he's had to fall several times, like he's told us. There's more to come right here on Autograph with the multiple award-winning D-Black. 
Thank you very much for staying here with us on Autograph, and we're always grateful to Alisa Hotel Northridge, and we're coming to you from the uh, Table Bay Bar. Now, um, you've you've done so much, you know, over this period. You know, you know after that big year in two thousand and nine, up till now, um, you're working on your third album, like you said. Okay, what's going to take the back seat for you to do your third album? Everything else, because um, I feel like from 2013 to 2014, I wasn't, I wasn't really focusing on the music. I was focusing on so many other things, and I made music take the back seat. So I decided for the rest of the year, for the rest of 2015, I was going to focus more on the music. Okay. And um, How far have you gone with recording? Or? Like I'm halfway through. Okay. Um, I'm halfway Who are you through featuring this time around? There's a lot of people on the album. Um, that's, uh, that's Fino from Nigeria, that's Davido from Nigeria, that's Shay Shay from Nigeria. Those songs are done. Um, there's Casper Nyoves from South Africa, um, there's Uhuru from South Africa, there's Donald from South Africa, there's Sakodia Eo from Ghana as well, Stoneboy from Ghana as well. It must have cost you a lot to try to get everybody's you know, input into this. Um, I wouldn't say it did financially, but the workload, yeah. And trying to just put everything together is it's quite hectic, it's quite tedious. And and I started working on this album last year, I think, but not as intensely as I am now. Because the release date is the uh, 15th of October, and uh, I need to wrap up the album in the next month. I see. So now you got to speed up. Uh, we've done quite a number of tracks, but what we've selected so far is just half of what we're trying to put out. So we have we have another month to go to, to select the other half. Mm. And, and finish it and tighten it up. And um, I just want it to be, I want it to be a mixture of different genres. There's, 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 a, house, there's a house vibe on, on the album. There's hip hop and there's hip life, there's Afro beats, there's high life, there's everything in there. And, and I, I don't want to just be labeled as a hip hop artist. I want to be able to do different genres and, and just call it music. I want the album to be different. My first album was all hip hop. My second album started digressing towards the hip life Afrobeats vibe and now I just want a mixture of everything so I'm working why, why are you trying to get a bit of everything because I want it, I don't want it, I don't, I, don't, I don't want it to be put in a box I don't want it to be called a hip hop album I don't want it to be called a hip life album I don't want it to be called a, an Afrobeats album I want it to be called music and, 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 and I want to appeal to different ages different, peop different people I want to appeal to the people in SA who love house music you know and hip hop I want to appeal to the people in Ghana who love hip life and high life. I want to appeal to the people in, in, in Europe who love Afrobeats music. So I want to do a bit of everything for everyone. You know? mm, I see. All right, so it's coming up in October. We're looking for October 15th. That. What about the movies? I'm wondering, what about the movies? Um, initially, we, we plan to make a movie every single year. You know, and um, till this album is done, I can't say we're going to do another movie this year. The plan is to. But once I'm done with the album, and I, like I said, everything is going to take a back seat. Once I'm done with this album and it's out, then we can move on to say, okay, now we're about to do this movie and put it out in December or whatnot. But till the album is done, I don't want to talk about doing other projects yet. Mm, I see, I see. You've, you've, you've traveled, uh, you know, you've traveled around the world. You've done a whole lot of stuff. Uh, you've shared stages with. All of the big names you can think about, especially in the hip hop world. Mm -hmm. I mean, Jay Z, Memphis Bleak, uh, Chris Brown, Rick Ross. Okay, tell me Buster about Ryan. those experiences. I mean, standing on the same stage that Jay Z performed on, from you who's coming from, I mean, this background and all of that. Um, to be quite honest, it wasn't like I was on the same stage with Jay Z performing at the same time. Of course, of course, no. Okay, so, so well, for the benefit of those who don't understand sharing this thing, it's, that's why I said standing on the same stage mm -hmm. or, you know, playing on the same stage, yeah. It's <laughs> <laughs> I know, you know, a lot of people think it's, you know, yeah, you every time, yeah, At sure. the same time, you know. <laughs> it, I, was, I was an opening act for Jay-Z in 2020, 2020, 2009, 2010. Where? Conference Center, Ghana. For his, for, his, for his concert, yeah. 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 Um, that was one of the first times I actually performed ever in my life. I wasn't one of those people that grew up 
an underground rapper performing in different places. But performing at a conference center was probably like the third time I'd ever even performed I held a mic in front of people, ever. And, and how did it go for you? I mean, your... It was, I mean, that was your, about the biggest performance at that time of your career. Yeah, and I didn't even have a song. Like, I didn't even have a hit song. Like, I just had, like, a couple things on the internet, and at that time, there was High Five, and it's, there wasn't WhatsApp, there wasn't Instagram, there wasn't Twitter. It was just, I just, had, I just had a song. And I had a few friends on radio who were just playing it once in a while. But I was, just, I was privileged to, to be able to, to perform. And then from that point, then I think uh, I did Busta Rhymes. When me and Kweku started putting music out, then, then we did the Busta Rhymes concert. And then, um, what else did, what, what did we do next? Rick Ross, when I, when I went solo. Then, then I performed with Rick Ross. And then, uh, and then um, the Memphis Bleak came. And then, uh, then Chris Brown. Yeah, Chris Brown. At, at, the, Brown. at the stadium. Yeah. And um, there's just so many, so I performed in like like over 40 cities, in Italy, in Amsterdam, in New York, Boston. Atlanta. Which of them would you say? I mean, away from Ghana and all of the big concerts that we've done here, which of them would you say you know uh, have left you know Amsterdam. a big mark on your heart? Why Amsterdam? Amsterdam had like 10,000 people. Wow. Yeah, and it was it was three Ghanaian artists doing a concert and there were like 10,000 people. Wow. Myself, R2Bs, and Fuse, ODG, and uh, yeah, and Joey V. And it was just almost like 10,000 people there. It was, it was a crazy experience. And, and, and to get that in Ghana is fine. Because Ghana, it's home, this is home, home, yeah. But to get that outside of Ghana, it was, cra it, was, it, was, it was a crazy experience for And me. it was obviously people coming from all over the place, mixed yeah, race and all. Yeah, I mean, people who were coming because they knew this song and they knew this artist and wow. they bought tickets and came. It was a huge deal for me. Wow. You know, and, and this is around... This is like a year ago. I see. So it was a big deal for me. Yeah, about a year and a half ago. March 2nd, 2014. Wow. Yeah. Wow. It was, a, it was a big deal for me. And then after that, we did a UK tour too. So that experience was just, it was just, and then something else, and, and then and then in London at the O2. O2 Arena. Yes, mm -hmm. this, was, this was just me headlining. There was like 5,000 people there. This is when I put out Vera. Vera was huge in, in London. What was, the, what was the, the thing behind Vera? Vera was, Vera was actually done by mistake. Okay. I, uh, like I said, me and Reggie Ruxton were really close. So he went for a shoot in, in Cape Town with Glow. And I, I, I didn't have any endorsement deal at the time. I was just still on like my first album. And he was like, yo, let's go. So I went with him. And um, he was like a big brother to me. And he was talking to me. And he said, yo, um, you know, he, he can rap in English. Everybody knows that. But he caught his break in Ghana when he started rapping in Tree and doing the hip life. Uh, viable music, and he was he was trying to tell me to make a song in tree, and I, and I explained to him and I said, I don't have a good command of, of the tree language. the tree language to make music in tree. I don't have a good command of ga to make music in ga, but it's difficult to be commercially successful rapping in only English. You will not get as much airplay, so. You would always have to try and squeeze in a guy or tree word or pigeon in there, you know? And I said, I couldn't do it. I didn't want to sound like, like an idiot, excuse me to say, trying to rap in tree when I can't even speak tree properly. So he said, what about pigeon? And I thought, yeah, pigeon, they're to speak every day. I'll do something for pigeon inside. And he said, okay, he's going to go do this glow shoot, and I should do a song in pigeon. And I was like, okay, cool. So he went, and I, I wrote a song in pigeon, and the song I wrote was Vera. See. So I came back to Ghana, and I still had the song. So it was just trying, just trying your hands on something because I'd never done it before. I'd never done a song in, in, in a prison. I just decided to do a song where I was crying and complaining to my friends about something a girl did to me in prison. I was actually telling a story that had happened to me earlier on in life, I but I, I, but I did it in prison. So I came back and, and then I recorded it. Okay, so it happened earlier on in life. Yeah, but like, uh, b uh, not the entire story is, mm -hmm. the entire story is a bit exaggerated in different places. But I came back and then I, I recorded a song 
And I wasn't even sure about how Ghanaians would receive it because I'd been rapping in English the whole time. So with Vera, I didn't even do promo CDs. I didn't do, I didn't do nothing. I just put it on my Facebook and then that was it. It just took off from there. I see. I didn't promote it. Like, I didn't do CDs. I wasn't even sure about the song. So I just put it on my Facebook. I was promoting another song at the time. I was promoting this song called um, uh, Change Your Life, Bunny Machaki Me, with the uh, EL. And then all of a sudden, Vera just psh, it blew everything out the water. And, and then Vera was like the number one song in the country for a very long time. What kind of feedback um, did you get from people? Because I've been to places where we've had older folk, people mm -hmm. who are, you know, should be more drawn to old school music and, and you know, Afro beats and all of that. So, who are just madly in love with this one. Have you, have you come across any fans who are, you know, of the mature crowd and, and you know? The Vera song? Yeah. Yeah, like, till to, to, to today, I'm like, yo, I've done, I've done personal person, man, with Castro. I've, I've, I did say how with Castro. I've done Red Cup. I've done so many songs, but then I walk outside and then it says, oh, Vera. And I'm like, yo, that's, that's, that's three years ago. But it must make you feel very proud because, I mean, you've done something and it's like it's a, it's a timeless piece and it's there. People, It's like this. Yeah. Um, you feel good because it's your song. Yeah. You wrote it, you recorded it, it's your song. But then at the same time, every musician's, every musician dreads having to outdo yourself. Okay. After having a big song... You need to have a bigger song. The next year, you have to come back with a bigger song. Now, when your song is too big, and then you can't match up to what you did the year before... Do you, you have, have the feeling that you've not been able to match up to Vera ever since? Um, Vera was in 2012. Yeah. 2013, I didn't. 2014, I would say, um, being a part of Seho with Castro and personal person with Castro was able to balance that out. And I was like, okay, cool, cool. cool. Now we've been able so, to... So you, had, you, have, you have the satisfaction that, I mean, the Castro collaborations are, are like way up there as well. Yeah. Right. I mean, when I look at the numbers, when I look at the numbers on YouTube and the downloads, I'm like, okay, yeah, we did better than we did with, 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 with Vera. Only thing is that it's, 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 very, it's difficult for me now to perform those songs without Castro around, you know? Yeah. And, and the performances are what pushes the song more. I feel like the songs could have been way, 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 way bigger than they are. Mm. Where were you on last Sunday? I was home. You were home in Accra? Yeah, I, I, I spoke to him the Friday. He had traveled, he came back on the, he came back on Thursday. And at that time we are producing that TV show, the EFJ show, so you're supposed to be a guest on the show on Friday. You're supposed to land on Thursday and then come do the interview on Friday. So when he landed on Thursday, he called me and said, oh, Charlie, can we, can we do the interview on Monday? He has to go for a funeral in Kumasi over the weekend. So I said, okay, cool, we'll do it on Monday. So I spoke to him. His brother, who's his manager, also called me and said, yeah, can we do it on Monday? And I was like, all right, cool. He said, we're going for a funeral. And then um, he was supposed to leave for the funeral on Saturday morning. And then um, Castro decided not to go to the funeral. He decided to go to a dam with uh, Samuel John. So his brother went to the funeral by himself. And that was on Saturday. Then um, Sunday, I was home, and then somebody called me and said Castro had drowned in Adan. I didn't know that he hadn't decided, he had decided not to go to the funeral anymore. I see. So I was like, nah, he's in Kumasi. I was like, nah, 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 nah. He's not in Kumasi, he's drowned in Adan. I was like, nah. Okay, so I called his brother. I called his phone. It was ringing, nobody was picking up. So I called his brother. His brother, too, wasn't picking up. So I went on his Instagram, and there was no pictures. Then I went on his brother's Instagram, and I saw pictures of his brother at the funeral, but Castro was not in the picture. I was like, yeah, what's going on? So then I just kept waiting to hear from, 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 from them. And then his brother called me and said, yo, he just heard the same thing, so he's rushing back to Accra, and that Castro didn't go with him to Kumasi. He went to Adan with Asamajan, so he's actually in Adan. He's trying to call him. His phone is about to die. Right now, he's getting on a bus to come back because he can't wait for a flight. But his phone's going to be dead all the way to Accra. Wow. So imagine hearing this about your brother and sitting on a bus. And not having access no, to a phone. With no phone. 
and then different people just kept calling me and telling me this is what happened. And it was Sunday afternoon, <coughs> and then um, I didn't really believe it. So his brother got to a car and said, "Yo, they're going to a down. They can't find the body." And it's like, whoa. And it, like it affected everybody, you know, from myself to DJ Breezy. He was working with DJ Breezy on his album. Yeah, on his upcoming album. Yeah. You see. They've done like four or five songs. Songs that nobody had even heard. And the songs are just there, you know? And we've done like a part two of Personal Person. I see. And that song is still just there. And we had like, we had, we had so many plans, man. We had so many shows booked. We had like a tour in Canada booked. We we're ready to go. I couldn't do it without him, so I pulled out of that one. We had so much planned, man, and it was just sad that we still don't know where he is. And but uh, what you make of all of the commentary that have that you know that have surrounded all of this? You know, people saying all sorts of things. Some making fun of it. Some, yeah. you know, trying to say I, I saw him here, I saw him there. That's human nature. Not everybody's a good person, you know. We have we have bad people in in the world. Even the greatest, from Michael Jackson to Whitney Houston, and the people that touch the world with their music experience the same thing because not everybody's a good person. Not everybody's compassionate. Excuse me, we have a few idiots in, in society, and I mean, that's just the way it is. And I just pray that the most important thing is if he's alive, we just pray that he comes back safely, you know? And I pray for his family and his friends, the people that were close to him, you know. <coughs> we miss him and, and we always think about him. I see. All right. Now, um, you spoke about your, your having a daughter. Yeah. You have a daughter. How two, old is she? I got two daughters. Two. Okay. Hmm. How are they doing? Very well. Hmm. We'll talk about them in a bit. But remember, we're here with D Black. And uh, once again, we say thank you to Alisa Hotel North Ridge, where we always bring you autograph from the uh, Table Bay Bar. Okay, so the man of many parts. Uh, some of you only know his bit about music, but um, he has so many other things that he does uh, as we speak. And of course, we've gone into a bit of them. We've had, we have more to do. That's the reason why you have to stay right here. This is autograph, and I'm sharing the company of D Black. <laughs> All right, thank you very much for staying here with us on Autograph. And uh, D Black, you were talking about your daughters. You have two daughters? Yeah. Okay, from one mother? Yeah. Okay. Um, relationship status? I'm, I'm not married, but I'm not looking. Oh, you're not looking? Okay. I'm gone. You're gone, okay. So you're in a stable relationship? Yeah. Uh, the mother of your children? Yeah. Or, oh, I see. Okay. Um, you, you, you have... Your dad had children who... What, five women, you said? Yeah. Five. Hmm, I see. You have a grin. No, I'm waiting for your next question. <laughs> <laughs> What's running through your mind? No, no, no. I'm Were you thinking that I'll, I'll turn out that way? No, I don't, I don't think so. Okay. When you were growing up, what did you? What was your, your plan for that, that part of your life? I never really thought about it. You never thought about it? Never. Hmm. I was too focused on working. Hmm. And being successful at whatever I was going to do. I never really thought about getting married and stuff. Never. Hmm. Okay, but you've also had your fair share of the, uh, the stardom, getting loads of women coming at you and throwing themselves at you and everything. Unfortunately, unfortunately, um, my relationship with the mother of my kids started even before D Black started. I see. It was uh, six years ago. 2009, before I even put out my first song. Mm. So she didn't, she was there for the okay, whole... so she was there when you were sleeping in friends' houses and all of that? Yeah. Oh, I see. That's, that's some big loyalty, huh? Yeah. Well, she's been there from jump. I see. So I didn't have the luxury mm. of all of that stuff. Mm. Yeah. Okay, so you wished you had done a bit of that, like, you know, explored a bit before... I refuse to answer that question. Uh -huh. But you have to. <laughs> I refuse to answer that question. I'm happy. You're happy. 
happy. Yeah, I'm good. But you, you still have a few aggressive people, a few, a few aggressive ladies who throw themselves at you, you know? Yeah. It happens across the place. I'm, I'm, I'm too busy with work to even look at that kind of stuff. Mm. Honest truth. Mm. But you see, there's a difference between you not wanting to look and you wanting to... No, I don't even pay attention. Some of it, some of it is unconscious. It, it, it just happens. You, know? you just notice, okay, this... I don't even pay attention. I mean, it hasn't been like a smooth relationship mm. with the mother of my kids. It's been off on, you know. But I haven't really paid attention to... Do you, do, you, do you get any kind of pressure from anywhere to nah, no settle, pressure. like, formalize your relationship with her? No pressure. Hmm. She doesn't say anything about that as well? She's happy with you? I'm a, like I said... You live together? No, nah, I live by myself. Okay. But my relationship with the mother of my kids hasn't been smooth. Hmm. Enough for, for, for me to say, okay, I'm about to get married now. You know? It's been... So whose fault is it? Is it yours? Is it hers? It's, it's. Um, to be honest, I don't really like putting my personals out there like that. Mm. But it, it just hasn't been a smooth relationship, and it's uh, it comes with my job, you know. It can never be smooth. I see. Yeah. All right. Now, what's the regular day like? I mean, nowadays, uh, the D Black of twenty fifteen. I work every day of my life, eh? I live by myself, but I live with my producer, DJ Breezy. He makes the majority of my music. The studio is in the house. So if any idea hits you, you walk straight there? Yeah, DJ Breezy has his part of the house as well. He's like a few seconds away from me. My graphic designer is also in the house. So work surrounds you. My office is upstairs. Mm. And like, I'm always working. And because I love what I do so much, it doesn't even feel like work. Okay. You know, when we, when we go to the nightclub and we're partying and we're drinking and having fun, whatever I'm drinking is work because I'm a brand ambassador for Ciroc. Mm. And I'm supposed to do that. I'm supposed to party and drink Ciroc. So I'm, I'm partying, but it's work at the same time. Um, I'm in the studio enjoying music, but it's work. Okay. Um, aside, aside the the clubbing and the the brand activation for Ciroc Vodka, uh, what else is fun? What else is everything I do, man? I love I love my job. So my job is fun. Like I travel a lot. I love traveling, and it comes with my job every other Where week. Where else do you want to go? Um, I've been everywhere, yeah. Apart from like China. Hmm. Well, I've been everywhere, from Dubai to Europe to London, America. Where else is it? South Africa, Nigeria. Do you like flying? The experience? No, 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 I don't like flying. I just what, like, about, what, about, what about flying don't you like? Just sitting down for such a long period. Mm. I see. And it's just sitting down, it's not doing anything. It's a bit never Sitting in one place for a long time becomes yeah. an issue for you. And... Um, have you had any very rough experience with flying nah. before? Never. It's, the closest was like going to Kumasi sometime mm -hmm. with a bunch of different artists and, and, and then the, the, there was turbulence and Tiny started crying <laughs> on the plane. This was like, we'll bring him here to talk yeah, about it sometime. He started crying. Um, this is a 20, 2010. Wow. Yeah, he was crying. He started crying? Yeah, so he didn't fly back. He came by road. Wow. You're like, nah, I'm not going to sit on the plane, no. Mm. And this is three days after we landed. Hey, what were you doing? Oh, I was fine. You were fine? I was fine. I'm trying to be a hard guy. Mm. But he, he started... Deep, deep within you, you were... You know. Yeah, it was rough. It was, it was rough. There was, there, was, there was a lot of people on the flight, so I knew that was going down. I wasn't by myself, eh? I see. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that's, I haven't had any bad experiences flying, though. Mm. So yeah. you'd want to fly any day? I mean... Yeah, it's work, you know. Away comes. from the time that it takes from you and everything. And and really, right now with all this doom so rubbish, nobody really wants to be in Ghana for too long, eh? Mm. You wake up at six o'clock, your lights are off. Twenty four hours, lights is back. Twelve hours is gone. Nobody enjoys it. So any opportunity to fly now, my call. Jump at it. Yep. Mm. What's the longest time you had to stay away from Ghana? 
I think two months. Two months. Where? Where was that? I think in America. In America? Yeah. Okay. okay. Which state did you stay in? Different places. Mm. I see. Yeah. You talked about your siblings. You've had, you have a, what, nine other siblings? Yeah. There's mm. ten. Where's everybody? Um, there's two in Ghana. Okay. So plus myself, there's three of us in Ghana. There's, um, there's four in London. And then the other three in America. What, what is everybody doing? Everybody's doing different things, huh? Eh? Mm. Everybody's doing different things. Everybody's very different. I see. Yeah. My older sisters, everybody, everybody's doing, nobody's similar in any way. Wow. Yeah. Some, some, uh, one of my brothers is a lecturer in a university. One of them is a, is a manager at Next. Um, one of them is a, one of them is still in uni doing his PhD. Everybody's really very, very different. My sister just finished um, her master's and she just opened a, a company called um, Stock Fox. That um, whatever, if you want to buy anything from the states, say you saw some shoes online and it cost fifty dollars, and you wanted them in Ghana, she'll get them to you in Ghana in three, four days. See. Yeah, and uh, she's doing pretty, pretty well. The officers I know, too. Um, that's like my younger sister. She's like 28. Um, one of my brothers is a graphic designer, Kevin. Everybody's doing different stuff, eh? Wow. I see. So at least everybody is uh, comfortable and everybody's fine. Yeah, everybody's fine. Oh, I see. How does your mom relate to you now? What does she say to you now? I mean, after all of this that has happened and... I mean, she's happy. She's happy, man, and I know she's she's proud of me. And uh, at least I proved to her that I could do what she wanted me to do, and also follow my dreams, and, and be able to balance it out. You know, I finished university like she always wanted me to, and then I follow my dreams as well. And and I'm I'm successful at it, and I work very hard. I know she's proud of me. You know. Mm, I see. What has been the the driving force, the inspiration, the uh the target point because I mean it, you're human and obviously if, you, if you're having to move from place to place sleep in friends homes and their couches and all of that something surely would want to bring you down or bring your spirit down at one point or the other nah man I never get discouraged I think that's one of my strongest traits nothing can bring me down ever there's nothing you can tell me or show me to make me feel bad or negative vibes about myself or what I do. Nah. Did you ever have to, you know, beg or, you know, talk extra for an events organizer to put you on a stage in the early stages? Yeah. yeah. Tell me about some of them. There was this, exp there was this one time, um, Chatterhouse had brought um, Kevin Little and Wayne Wonder. I remember that. I remember that very well. La Body Beach. Yeah. I said, Charlie, I have to be on the show. I so did you also go cry? <laughs> no, I went to, me and Quick T went to beg. You begged? And then, uh, what you call it? So like, oh, give us a chance to perform. And um, the, the guy in charge, Fred Darko. Mm. I won't forget, Fred Darko said, oh, yeah, okay. Uh, you come to the beach and meet us. When you come there, call me. He never picked his call. Wow. Yeah, and um, we never got to do that show, but a year later, they paid us to perform with Buster Rhymes. Wow. I was like, it's one of those things, you know, you got to go through all of that hustle to, and, and it, it pushes you to work harder. You know, I don't think, to be honest with you, I don't think we're ready to perform at the Kevin Little and we won the show. We didn't have any popular songs. We just wanted to be on, you know. And when you had paid the dues that you're supposed to pay, it'll, it'll work out for you eventually, you know. See. Now, are you are you religious? Are you a spiritual person? I'm not a spiritual person. I'm a Christian though, but I just believe in being a good person and um, doing unto others what you do unto yourself. Just have a good, clean heart. Follow the Ten Commandments and just be a good person. You know, that's what I believe in. Hmm. You don't do church. I do church. Where? I do church once in a while. I should be done well. I'm not like every Sunday I go to church person. You know. I haven't been to church in, a, in quite a while, but I pray almost every day of my life. Mm, I see, I see. 
Um, let's talk a bit of lifestyle stuff. Um, I think you've trimmed a little bit. Are you? Are you? Have you started working? Have <laughs> you told my boys to still laugh? <laughs> yeah, but but yeah. I think you've trimmed a little. I go bit. on and off. On and off. Okay. On and off. It's not. It's not easy trying to balance what I do and traveling all the time and eating healthy and working out. It's not easy. I, I have a personal trainer, and, and uh, I went out. I went to. I only kept out for three weeks, and I, I I never worked out while I was there. I Just never eating and drinking and yeah. You know, so now I have to balance it. I have to go back to that and cut down on all the stuff that how, how how tough is it for you bruh none of my boys want to work out one of my managers is a macho man he doesn't even want to work out he doesn't need to work out mm. breezy is like my two fingers skinny and then my other manager who's like my size he doesn't like working out he's lazy so there's no motivation oh, I so see. i gotta do it myself how often do you do checkups at the hospital as well um um to be honest a rough idea, probably like once a year. Hmm. Yeah. And what do the doctors tell you about your state of health? No, um, actually, actually, um, my cholesterol level was high last year. I haven't really done anything about it, though. <laughs> 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 to be honest, so, but you're not scared about that. Um, it wasn't like oh my god, it's high. It's just yeah. some small thing. So I, I haven't really, but, uh, okay. but I'm, I'm good. So, so and I never fall sick. I've no. never been sick. In, I haven't been sick in eleven years. Okay, that's that's fine, but have you um, have you gone for the checkup this year? No, I went December last year. Okay. Yeah. So it? you're gonna wait for December to go? I don't have like a set month. Yeah. You know, like when I feel like I want to do it, I do it. You haven't felt like doing it. No, I mean it's not what like seven months. Okay, seven months. Well, that was bringing up, I guess. <laughs> well, someone's whispering, uh, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've spoken about a whole lot of things. Your hands are into so many things, and mm -hmm. um, I mean, you're you're representing brands with the face of syrup vodka. You have your own thing going on, and the next question is how much you're worth. Recently, a rich list was uh, was uh, released. Ha have you seen it? On the yeah, internet? yeah, I saw, saw it. it. How did you feel about it? I, I, I mean, your name is not in it, but you know. I want to be like that when I grow up. When you grow up, you're yeah. grown. I'm I'm not even thirty years old, eh? Mm. I'm but you've, you've I'm 20, done pretty well. I'm 29 years old. I'm still a young guy. I'm still, I'm still working. Mm. I, 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 you valued yourself. You, you have an idea. No. Nah. Your network. No. Nah. Mm. Not yet. I'm not there yet. I'm still working. I'm. Uh, it's just been six years working. Mm. I still have a long way to go. Maybe when I hit 10 years, then I can do that. But now I'm just working. I'm just hustling. I'm just trying to. I'm just trying to be a success. Okay, but, but when the younger person, somebody in school who's also trying to build dreams, sees D Black driving his Range Rover, he thinks, okay, this guy is, uh, you know, lives in his own place, has his businesses and everything, travels all over the place, he's, he's good. He's yeah, I mean, I'm not saying I'm not good. I just haven't valued myself. And it's not all about money for me, you know. I'm not, I just want to be successful. And then when I'm but of course you, you do your business also to make your profits. Don't yeah, you? I, but I haven't valued myself. Mm. You know, I don't see myself as a millionaire. I'm not a millionaire. Not that I don't see my. I'm not a millionaire. I'm not. I'm not on that level yet. But I'll get there one day. Mm. How and you've given yourself what ten years? No, like ten years I, I, or I th less. No, I'm saying that I've worked for six years. Mm. Maybe when I hit the ten year mark, then I can say, okay, let me value myself and hopefully, you know. I'm 29, so four more years. Maybe when I'm 33. <laughs> D Black has been great sharing your company. Thank you so much for making Thank the time. Thank you too, man. And um, so the album is uh, hitting the, the. Yes, it's gonna be. It's gonna be out on the 15th of October. Okay, so. Um, it's called the Gray Area. Okay. Probably about. Why the Gray Area? You know what the Gray Area means, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's something you can't you can't define what this album mm. is about. It's different genres, like I already explained. Sure. It's not a hip hop album. It's not an Afrobeat album. Not a hip hop album. It's the gray area. Totally undefined. Yes. Thank you for making the time, and uh, thank you all very much for joining us on this fabulous experience with uh, one of Ghana's uh, fastest moving uh, youthful musicians on the scene, and of course somebody <coughs> who's had his hands uh, sunk deep, or sunk deep, uh, sunk his hands real deep 
into the uh, entertainment industry. So D Black has been my guest tonight. We say thank you once again to Alisa Hotel Northridge. I'll be on your TV from uh, 9 p.m. to 10 p.m. next Saturday, as we always do on the Joy Prime channel. And also remember that Joy Prime is free to air, so uh, you might as well also tune your other digital TVs in your home or elsewhere. Just catch it and always follow us on um, Autograph. You can also get on YouTube and watch our previous editions of Autograph. Thank you very much for watching. Have a pleasant weekend. My name is Nathaniel Atto.